Good evening, everybody. My name is Jen Holland. I'm the PTA president for uh, PTA Council for the school, CHUH School District. So thank you for coming out tonight. Um, we have a special guest today who is not only um, the CEO of Open Doors Academy, um, but she's also a friend. So without further ado, I want to introduce Miss Anne-Marie Grassi. All right. So thank you all for being here. I know there's a lot going on at Heights tonight, and I appreciate you um, attending this session. So I want to give a disclaimer. Um, two things. One, I don't have kids, but I have raised 600, OK? I started raising them when they were 10, though. So I missed all the fun time and took them on when they were the hardest. And the second thing is I am not a neurologist by trade. I am not a brain expert. What I do know is enough, um, I would say I, I know enough to be dangerous, and I know enough to, to be able to connect it to what works best. And so my goal today is to give you a brief overview of actual brain development in children to understand how it connects from birth all the way through adolescence. Um, how many of you guys have teenagers in this room? Oh, I've got some great information for you about why your kids do what they do. Um, and then afterwards, talk about some of the very core fundamental things that really impact brain development. And I think you're going to be surprised at what are probably most researched and most prominent in terms of that development. So um, I always start with something fun. And uh, these are, are quotes of parenting. So as you are working with your child and their brain, and they are developing, um, I thought these two represented it best. Some days it feels a little bit more like hostage negotiating with a band of drunken bipolar pirates than actual parenting. And then the other one is being a parent is kind of like becoming an Uber driver, except you're stuck with the same annoying customer for 18 years. So with that said, I commend all of you for being parents. I hope someday to actually have my own, um, but I commend all of you for, for the work and effort that you put forward. So just a little bit general overview of the brain. So the brain has uh, four core lobes plus the cerebellum. I'm sorry, yeah, four core lobes plus the cerebellum. So we have the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe. So the frontal lobe is mostly thinking, memory, decision making. The temporal lobe is focused on hearing, learning, and feeling. You've got the occipital lobe, which is in the back of our head, which is connected to our vision and sight, and the parietal lobe, which is connected to language and touch. And then, of course, your cerebellum is connected in there, which connects down to your spinal cord and is all about the balance and coordination. So a lot of times we talk about development, and there's the ultimate question, is it nature or is it nurture? Are we inherently talented, or is it our environment that determines who we are? Now, this has been a debate that has gone on for centuries and centuries and centuries. And the reality is, is you can't have one without the other. You just can't. The, re the way that our brain develops is a factor of what we're born with and what our environment dictates. So how we interact, how we experience our environment, and what we start with is, are the two key factors to understanding how our brain works and what helps. Now, we have two dominant hemispheres of our brain. The first is the left. Left is logic. So left is all about logic and reasoning and focus. Right is all about creativity, inspiration, excitement. Every one of us has a dominant area. We tend to either be dominant left or dominant right. It doesn't mean that we don't express or share in the other side. It simply means that we tend to be dominant. How many of you, in looking at your children, might say you have a dominant left brain child? OK. How many of you believe that you have a dominant right brain child? OK. Here's how we teach our kids. I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. Right? Now, I'm going to tell you that this is a huge issue, but it's not one we can resolve tonight. This is a much bigger issue that has been on the books for years. It's called education reform, and we're still working on it. It's not going to be resolved tonight, but there are things that I can share with you tonight that you can do 
to help your child independently despite this framework, okay? So let's talk about the beginning. So early childhood education begins early, even before birth. And this is so important, the way that, for those of you that will someday be grandparents, for those of you that are around babies, or around soon to be expecting mothers, the importance of before birth is in the, the brain begins developing in the womb. Begins developing in the womb. A lot of the way that our neurons connect, the way that we our lobes begin to develop, all begins in the womb. So it's really critical that prenatal care is so important in how our mothers uh, feed themselves with nutrition, stress, um, exercise, any and all of those things are really important, and it's, it's critical to focus on that. What we know is that 90% of the human brain is developed in the first three years. The first three years. I was in a meeting before this, and they were asking me what I was going to talk about, and they all, a lot of um, the people in the room have young children. They were all like, I got six months to get it figured out. I got three months to get it figured out before their last born becomes three. Um, but it is important to understand that the early years are incredibly critical to the development of the brain. Um, the, when we're younger, the younger a child is, this is the other important thing, is the more resilient and flexible the brain is. So a lot of times if there is damage done, if there is, um, whether it's physical, like a kid falls and hits them, their head, or whether there is an exposure to a risk or adverse thing, which we will talk about later in this, uh, this presentation, the, the younger they are, the more flexible and resilient their brain is. As we age, our brain becomes less resilient and less, less flexible. It's also why I always joke that um, as we get older, we become more set in our ways. We just aren't able to adapt. We're not able to adjust to new things. It's just part of the way that our plasticity of our brain shapes and changes. So these are just some slides to show you that development. So our neural connections, the neural connections are kind of like the energy grid, right? They're like the electrical grid. If you think about an electrical grid, or you think about if you're standing outside and you see all the poles, right, with all the connections of the wire that, that feed our phones, feed our electricity, all of that, right? That's kind of the role of the neural connections, right? They're the, they're the hub, they're the center point of connecting all those things together that makes the power work. In, in a human, the, the neural connections change over time. Some die off, some grow new, they become more efficient in use. But in those first three years, those first three years, we see the largest number of neural connections in growth. And you can see that here between a newborn, six month, and a two year old. I teach a class at Cleveland State on the span of human development, and I, I get to work with students who are actually studying to be exercise physiologists, physical therapists, um, athletic trainers, and they walk into my class, they hate it, because they've never studied human development, they know nothing about it, and by the time they walk out, my goal is to help them understand how it connects to their work. Erickson, Eric Erickson here, is one of my favorite theorists around child development, and I wish I could cover all these years for you, but I'm gonna focus on these first uh, couple here as we go through, but Erickson talked about that during life, there are different stages that we, we encounter, and how we respond and how the environment responds to us makes a huge difference in who we become. So there's different stages, so I'm gonna focus on these down here, but I wanna just kind of address them basically here. So the first one is basic trust. It's the trust versus mistrust stage. It's usually ages zero to two. Um, during this stage, a child determines whether or not he can trust the world or not based on the interactions he shares with those most close to him. As we age and we become a toddler, we begin to look at autonomy and doubt. And I'm actually gonna move forward because I think I have these. Um, I'm gonna come back to that one. I wanna go to autonomy and doubt and I'll come back. Autonomy and doubt, I love this picture. <laughs> I don't know how real it is, but it was just too great not to use. Um, but autonomy versus doubt is the idea that I can do something and be reassured that I did it well versus constantly questioning if it's okay that I do something. What's, what's the difference between that? What do you guys think is the difference between auto seeking autonomy and doubt? What is the behavior in the environment that will either enforce autonomy or clear doubt? 
venturing out uh, or you know taking some risks? Yes. Right. Yes. So being being encouraging risk taking, encouraging kids to do things on their own, and then what? What do we do when a kid does something on their own? We congratulate. Celebrate it. Right? You reinforce that behavior that you seek to have. If every time a kid goes and pulls out the pots and pans under the sink, and mom comes over and is like, what are you doing? I just put those away. What are you doing? We're creating doubt for our kids to be creative and to explore their world. Okay? So this is a really important stage to how our kids grow and how they move into adolescence and begin to trust their own instincts and willingness to try new things. Now, I'm going to go back to this one. So um, everybody's seen this photo, right? This was after, um, oh, this was after the, uh, one of the riots in, um, I can't remember where, but it was in the last year. It was after one of the riots, um, mostly dealing with uh, police brutality in our communities. And there was this show of empathy. And I think that this is one of the things that I'm going to stress throughout this entire at evening is the most important thing that we provide to our children is human touch. It is the glue that holds us all together. It is the thing that is most missing in our kids today. There is such a fear of human touch, empathy, and it is so necessary. It is the first stage. Trust versus mistrust. A child doesn't understand logic at birth. They don't understand the situation or the environment. What they understand is I am safe, I am protected, I am warm, I am nurtured. And that comes through human touch. Whether it's affection, whether it's that safe arm, whether it's the swaddle, that is so critical and it evolves all the way through. So we're going to come back to human touch because it starts at birth, but it's one of the things that I think is a central theme. I also believe that it's one of the things we've done the most damage around in terms of policy because I think a lot of the policies we've developed to keep our kids safe has actually caused more harm to them in terms of their, their development overall. So the third stage of Erickson is initiative versus guilt. So this again... How many of you guys ever remember, I want you to close your eyes and try to go really far back to when you were in school, and this was you. You raised your hand, proudly, right? Really proudly, you had the answer. And you had that teacher that never called on you. Or worse, you answered the question wrong, and somebody said to you, nope, that's wrong, or that's stupid, right? Those experiences early on will create a sense of either being willing to take those risks and, be, and show initiative or simply to feel insecure, guilt, or a sense of unwillingness to do so. So these first three stages are really, really critical to our kids, and they're, they're very important. And I think a lot of times we we don't realize the environment in which our kids are interacting and playing in that, that either reinforce them in a positive way or reinforce them in a negative way. So um, in early childhood, and I'm not an expert in early childhood. I have some breadth of understanding of it, but I'm definitely not Joan. I don't have the in-depth. I can say this about early childhood when it comes to brain development. There are things that we can do that really impacts. In addition to, and I want to stress this again, you'll hear me say it over and over again, human touch, affection, unconditional love. You'll hear me say that over and over again. I'll give you examples as we move forward as to why that's so important. But there are things that we can do very early on, and this is from the day a baby is born. Actually, even when they're in the womb, read to our babies in the womb. Read a book out loud. Sing. When they're born, play with them. Role model, reinforce behaviors. They say right here, this is one of my favorite quotes, is babies like hearing the same book over and over and over, and that's okay. Because they're not just hearing the words, yes, you may be tired of reading Peter Rabbit or Go to Sleep Bunny or whatever the book is, or Caterpillar, I know there's like a lot of them out there, 
But the reality is, is for them, it's reinforcing, it's hearing mom or dad's voice. It's that reassurance, it's that soft. What they're listening to is the intonation, the sound, the tone. It's creating that safe environment. And most often when we read to kids, how do we read to kids? Do we read like this? Right? We don't. What usually happens when you're reading to your child? They're snuggling up to you. They are in their brains connecting trust, safety, a safe place, they're creating memories, they're building a bond, and they're learning. They're learning through those experiences. The earliest messages that we send our kids matter the most. The earliest messages. Now listen, I understand this as good as the next person, but man, it is hard when that kid is on the ground, throwing the tantrum, having the fit, doing whatever they're doing, or when they're teenagers, throwing the tantrum, having a fit, the last thing that you want to do is comfort that kid. You want to be like, go to your room. Or shut up, right? Because it's hard. It's hard. But what our kids need to hear most in that moment, you're OK. I love you. You're OK. I love you. Those words of encouragement are so critical to our kids. There's a lot of research out there. There was a book written by uh, Robert Putnam called Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis. And in this book, he talks about the number of negative words that our kids hear versus positive. And in kids who they found to be the most successful, most successful kids in this research study, they found that those kids heard six times more words of encouragement than negative. And kids who were struggling most in life heard three times more negative than positive. It matters. And it's hard. It's hard to say. It's hard to find the small wins at times. And when they're cute and little, it's easier. Don't get me wrong. As they get older, it gets much harder. But it's so important. There was a... Um, the other day, uh, we take Open Doors takes our juniors and seniors to Tegucigalpa, Honduras for a week. This is a huge undertaking. It's very expensive. It requires a lot of work. We do a lot of planning for it. And man, oh man, I send out more reminders than not about where you're supposed to be when. And I have a very clear policy that when you miss a meeting, you're out. Like, you are expected to be there. A couple weeks ago, I had a student. She's not a Heights kid, so I can tell the story because I don't think she'll watch this. Um, I had a student who missed a meeting. And she called me, and she had a line of excuses out the door, every reason you could imagine. And none of it was her fault. It was everybody else's fault but hers. And I sat down, and I was angry. I was angry because she put me in the position of having to decide if she still gets to go on this trip or not. So I was angry. And I said to her on the phone, I said, here's what I need to hear from you. This is what I'm not hearing. This is what I need to hear from you. I need you to know how I feel. And the thing I ended that conversation with is, you're OK. It's not about you. I'm concerned with the decision and the behaviors, not you. You're still an incredible young woman, and I still love you. Our kids need to be reassured that they're OK, whether they're this little or whether they're this big. They need to be reassured of that. Nutrition. So here's, if you didn't believe it, here's the reason why nutrition matters. Um, you know, our kids get a lot of chemicals, <laughs> a lot of byproducts. There's a reason why we are seeing increased rates of gut health issues, why we're seeing more kids with ulcers, why we're seeing more kids with colitis and Crohn's and, and all sorts of different things. The food we feed our kids is, is not providing them the adequate nutrition that they need. And it is very important. So kids that eat better, eat more vegetables, eat more fruit, eat less Cheetos, eat less Mountain Dew, not all gone, because we know they're kids and they're going to eat it. But the better that we feed our children, the more we see better school performance, faster language development, fewer behavioral issues, healthy weight and head, uh, head size, fewer fine motor issues, better wired brains, faster and more organized brain, and a higher IQ score. So if that's not a reason to find more veggies, I don't know what it is. But that is, it is a key component to uh, the size of our kids' brains and, and the rate in which it's developing. So let's talk a little bit about the adolescent brain. This is the fun stuff. 
So here's the teenage brain. I think under construction is the best way to talk about the teenage brain because it is truly under construction. Now, here's some of the things you're going to notice in your teenager, or you may have noticed. Your child will tend to struggle to read facial expressions. They will respond and react differently because they may not understand what they're seeing. Kids with adolescents, their brain, um, sorry, kids in adolescents tend to misunderstand facial expressions, especially subtle facial expressions. So they don't always see them and connect them logically. They tend to have heightened social anxiety. They tend to engage in more risk-taking behaviors, which we'll talk a lot about. They misunderstand verbal cues. Um, like, for example, like, hey, I need you to take out the trash. OK. An hour later, I need you to take out the trash. Uh-huh. I need you to take out the trash right now. Why did you say so? Like, right? They don't, they don't pick up on the cues that we're often telling them. Um, they uh, have a totally different information processing system, and this is key. And there's this little tiny thing in your brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is your emotional regulation. Okay? The amygdala in adolescence is huge compared to their prefrontal cortex, which is not developed. Now, the prefrontal cortex is at this part in your frontal lobe. And prefrontal cortex is designed to logic, information and decision making, um, uh, impulsive, uh, uh, impulsivity control, all happen to the prefrontal. So you're going to see that the prefrontal is really small, the amygdala is really big, and that kids and adolescents do not make decisions without both in play. So logic is a, a tough argument to have with a teenager. And I'm sure everybody in this room who has a teenager has at some point said, why can't I reason with my teenager? Now there are times, and we'll get to that hot and cold cognition area, but it is there. Uh, the amygdala also leads to a feeling of invincibility, right? So I still remember being 17 years old, coming back from homecoming, and I grew up out in uh, Russell Township, way out, and there's a road out there called Dines Road, and Dines Road is very hilly. And if you take it in a car at 80 miles per hour, you can make some really big jumps. Okay, it's also probably one of the most dangerous things you'll ever do, right? But at that point, it was just fun. I couldn't get harmed. Car accident? No, not me. I'm good, right? At that age, we think we're invincible, and a lot of that is tied to the emotional regulation. And then the egocentrism, the ego, and the imaginary audience, which I'll talk about here in a minute, is huge. So this is your teenager's brain. Does this make sense? Right? So we see here the love is a huge area, right? Every teenager is madly in love with someone at some point all the time. You see the self-image is a key area there. Um, addiction to the Facebook and the cell phone, the rebellion, the ego, slamming and punching reflex, which we'll talk about that, that link to that impulsivity. Um, the uh, uh, TV storage, like or hate, um, and I always talk about teenagers as either one of two things. You're either on top of the world and rocking out life, or the world's on top of you and it's come to an end. There's no in-between. And a lot of that has to deal with the amount of emotional charge that is going on in the adolescent brain. So we deal with two issues. We have things called hot and cold cognition. So cold cognition is logical, right? This is when I'm alone, I can think rationally. Um, some of you with a teenager may have had a situation where they were really, really heightened and, and just blotting off anything that came out of their mouth. And then a couple hours later, they came down and sat down with you and said, okay, I thought through this and I wanna to talk to you about it, right? That's, a very, that's when they're in cold cognition. It means that they've, they've come down from the emotional heightenedness and they're able to kind of think a little bit more rationally about the decisions they're making. It can't happen in the moment. They actually need to process it. And a lot of times you'll hear kids say, I don't know why I did that. That's not a lie. They actually don't. They don't know because what happens is the emotion becomes so charged, the hormones reap into play, everything goes haywire, and they just drive. 
and then slowly pull back. Has anybody ever experienced that with their with a kid? Right? Heightened and then calm. Hot cognition is problem solving when adolescents are with their peers and have elevated emotions, sexual tension, any of those things. So when that amygdala is really big, they just are off the hook and everything's about the emotion. It's not about rational or uh, logic. So even if they know it's the dumbest decision in the world, the, the emotional charge, the sexual charge, the tension in there is driving them to make a decision against the logic. It's like a little battle, right? It's the good, e the good angel and the bad angel, um, but for them it's pretty big. So this is uh, another way of looking at it. I'm the rational part up here, don't blame me for stupidity. And then I'm the emotional part, part um, blame me for all the stupidity. So most of what our kids do is linked to the emotional charge. And I'll share with you a story um, from my own childhood that I often relate to this experience. So when I was in the seventh grade, I was madly, madly in love with this boy named Vince. And I just thought he, the sun rose with him and the sun set. I dreamed about him every night and I imagined our future. Seventh grade, seventh grade. I had everything planned out, our kids, our house, everything. Um, my best friend at the time thought it would be a great idea if I sent him a secret in my word note. So I wrote him this letter and we grew up on a street called Whispering Pines. So I wrote, the opposite name of my street is Shouting Oaks. Like, you know, we lived in a very small community, so everybody knew everybody. And of course, my best friend shows up at school and passes it to his friend, who then passes it to him. Well, again, my best friend passed the note, so it's pretty obvious to figure out who it was from. And um, Vince decided it was hysterical. And so he and his friends went to the school library, which at the time you could pay five cents to make copies. And they made 150 copies, and they sold it around the school. And teachers bought this letter. <laughs> Teachers bought this letter. So um, we're in the lunchroom. I'm already upset, right? Sitting with my, my group of friends. And Vince and his friends come over. They start waving the papers in my face. Well, I'm going to tell you that I don't recall anything but the sheer fury that went through my body. And nothing, no matter how wrong I thought it was, Nothing was going to stop me. I mean, my emotion was so charged. And I remember standing up, and I, I, mean, I can tell you what I was wearing that day and everything. This was seventh grade. And I walked over to his table, and he was sitting on the end of the table, and I said, Vince, I won't say his last name, Vince, you're a beep. And I went, boom, and smacked him, left the finger handprint on his face, tears rolling down his eyes. And in that moment, I was like, and then 10 minutes later, I was like, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap, right? But in that moment, my emotions were so charged, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And that's what our teenagers deal with on a daily basis. That's why they can't control themselves. To this day, I, I know it was wrong. And I, by the way, I didn't get in trouble. All the teachers watched me do it, and I didn't get in trouble. That was called the 1990s. But, um... <laughs> And they all had the letters, so I think they felt a little bit of, well, he got what he deserved. Um, but I think, again, you know, understanding that that is not your kid just being disrespectful, that's not your kid just being annoying, it really is out of their control in some ways. And you have to remember that when they're emotionally charged, they cannot control those behaviors. So um, the, limbic re uh, the limbic reward system, this all ties together. So the limbic reward system rewards our kids uh, neurologically for, to reinforce behaviors. And when things, the limbic system, it determines what feels good and what doesn't. So what feels good oftentimes are things like alcohol, drugs. But what we're seeing now is we're seeing even more around social media, Facebook, um, Snapchat, you name it, our kids get reinforced by behavior of feeling good, and it continues to build that for them. So that's another component of it, which is why our kids are so heavily addicted, although we as adults are also heavily addicted to social media. It's, it's part of that sensation of safety and comfort. It also can link back to that, that sense of, remember I talked about human touch. When we're not getting that sense of belonging and comfort, we seek it in other ways. When you're sitting in a room and you don't know anyone, or maybe you don't have enough friends, what do you do? What's the number one thing we do? 
We all do it. We do it in the doctor's office appointments. We get to our phone. Our phone becomes the comfort. So we have kind of rewired ourselves to see that the phone becomes the comfort. One last component of, well, too quickly, one last component of adolescence is egocentrism. This is one of my favorite things about adolescence. I love the way kids think that they are on the stage and everybody's watching them. And I didn't understand this at first, but I think it's really important when we look at how a kid develops. Egocentrism is the idea that the whole world is watching me. I am so incredibly important that the whole world is watching me. And every, don't embarrass me, mom. Don't embarrass me. The world is watching me. And this is, this photo is the best way to describe it. You see the little white duck in the middle and all, you know, he's amongst all the white ducks, but in his mind, he is so special that everyone watches him. This is why our kids get so embarrassed easily. This is why they're so hypersensitive about things. This is why it matters what they wear, who they are, how their hair is. They honestly believe the world revolves around them and that it's just watching them. It's a horrible feeling, right? Like, can you imagine that everywhere you go? Like, and I always laugh because I'm like, man, I go, I show up at the grocery store with my Ugg boots with my pants tucked in and my sweatshirt all like, and, and sometimes I'll have kids with me and be like, oh, Miss Amory, why are you wearing that? And I'm like, what do I care? But to them, everybody's watching them. Okay? And this comment over here says, my life would be simpler if everybody just liked the same things I do. All about me. And then this one, I just, I couldn't resist one. <laughs> this is a total teenage mouse. I can totally get away with this, right? That's that sense of invincibility. I can beat this system. So that's the adolescent brain in a nutshell. And one other thing I want to just kind of briefly talk about is screen time when we talk about our kids and the brain development. So there's a lot of research out there that shows pros and cons to screen time when it comes to brain development. Um, they say that prior to the age of two, there should be no screen time. Um, I think most parents in the United States have broken that policy. Um, so now they're saying, well, it's okay to have screen time if you're sitting and watching with your child and it's for a limited time. Um, I had dinner with friends of mine, they have a two-year-old, and the father said he goes, um, he took away the iPad after like an hour or something, and the kid proceeded to ignore him the rest of the day. Won't even acknowledge it. They're so easily addicted to that screen time. And remember what it reinforces. It's, it's not just about what they're watching, it's reinforcing a sense of comfort and safety for them. Um, this is, you know, the this is, I think, our, our modern history. If you see it in restaurants, we see it wherever we go, our kids are so connected. So there are things that they show if you're watching certain videos, if you're learning educational things, it's great. But what it is doing is, um, and I pulled this from somewhere, but it actually is damaging eyes. Um, and so we know that, in, like, the most interesting stat I found was in Asia, 90% of the population has been di diagnosed as nearsighted. 90%. So, you know, again, that exposure to a lot of screen time is going to damage eyes. It's going to impact the way the brain perceives vision and, and will begin to create more issues with that. The other thing that it affects is sleep. So, um, you know, it's not to say that our kids can't have access to the screen time. I know it's important, but I always have two rules. There's two places you can't use it. One is in the bedroom. So keep phones out of their bedrooms. Um, one, they're likely to stay awake longer texting their friends or doing things you don't want them to do. But two, it actually, even if they're um, just kind of watching it as they're falling asleep, it's actually affecting how they sleep, how deep they sleep. Um, it, the blue light is known to cause damage to sleep patterns um, and, uh, and so forth. The other time that we indicate that kids should be away from their phones is dinner table. When you sit as a family, whether it's at a restaurant, and I gotta tell you, this is harder for adults than kids. I do the same thing whenever we take our group of kids out to dinner, I am the first one to have to do this. Like, remind myself that I can't touch my phone. Because again, it's a, it's a, a call to, to do so. So this is the general recommended screen time, sleep time. Um, 
I should also indicate that in addition to screen time, sleep time in general is critical to brain development. So nutrition, sleep, and um, some of the important stages we talked about at the beginning are all really critical to building big, beautiful brains. Um, but looking here, this is what the American Pediatric Association recommends in terms of the amount of screen time your kids should have. Now we know most 13 to 18 year olds on average, nine hours of screen time a day. Nine hours. Recommendation, no more than two. Average kid is getting nine hours. That is doing something to their brains. Maybe a little good, but likely also a little bad. Yeah, a lot of bad actually. And it's affecting how they, um, how they learn. So, um, how many of you are familiar with toxic stress? A couple of people in the room? Okay, so um, toxic stress is, there's three levels of stress. There's positive stress, we all experience some positive stress um, right before a job interview, maybe it's before a big test, um, maybe it's before you get walked down the aisle, you know, there's a lot of things that we can have a little bit of good stress around. Um, then there's tolerable stress. Tolerable stress is serious but temporary. Serious but temporary. So everybody in life deals with periods of tolerable stress. Loss in the family, loss of a job, divorce, any of those things. Like everybody deals with short-term experiences of um, stress that are, are tolerable. Then we get to toxic stress. And toxic is prolonged activation of stress in the absence of protective relationships and support systems. So this is constant exposure to stress without proper support systems. And one of the most, in more recent research, they've come to identify a lot of this is something called ACEs. And this is what we talk about when we talk about kids is ACEs. And I have some papers on the back um, around ACEs, but ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. And um, there's a lot of research that's now showing that based on the number of adverse childhood experiences. So these could be as big as um, a abusive relationship, um, death of a family member, to something as small as a isolated incident uh, where a child was in harm's way, um, to uh, loss of a job. Anything that's causing a child to be exposed to stress. Or something as small as there wasn't enough food on the table for dinner for two days. Right? So. There, there's no necessarily indicator that this is an adverse childhood experience and this isn't. There's a range. But what they do know as well is that the more negative experiences that a child has, the more likely they are to have adverse issues later in life or adverse challenges later in life. So this is just kind of a picture. And I, I chose this picture for a very clear reason. I'm going to use another similar um, uh, analogy here in a minute. But um, these are some of the adverse childhood experiences that we seek and deal with. And as a result of these things, there's in early childhood, there's an implication. And this is it. For young children that experience more trauma, more negative experiences, more exposure to um, negative environments, we see that in the three-year-old child's brain, the child uh, who is uh, living in those situations has a physically smaller brain. Physically smaller brain. The brain does not develop as quickly or as, as large. So in a lot of our kids, we know that um, the brain can grow 20 to 30% smaller than those of their peers who are getting uh, different resources. We also know that toxic stress alters those neurons. Remember I talked about the neurons? Remember the picture with the three bars and all the different things? This is an example of a child with normal neuron connections developing and a child under toxic stress. So again, we're not connecting, we're not building, and we're not growing. So those experiences can have a very negative implication on how our children grow and develop, which is why it's important that we aid our child's brain in development. Um, so a couple, couple tidbits. The first is, do as I say, not as I do is not a good policy. 
So um, son, your screen time is up. Mom, can you monitor dad's screen time too? It is important that we role model behaviors for our kids that we seek for them to achieve. If we want our children to demonstrate more initiative and be more autonomous, we must show them how to do that. We must model the way for our kids. If we want our kids to be less time on their screens, it can't be, well, I'm an adult and therefore I said so. We just don't live in that world anymore. <laughs> can't work that way. The next thing is, is positive words of encouragement. And I can't stress this, I know how hard this is. I really do. It takes everything in my gut when I'm upset with a kid and having a word with them to make sure that I end that conversation with one positive statement and a, an affirmation of love. And it is hard at times, but you have to do it. Our kids need to know that they are loved, that they are supported, and that they're safe. That they are loved, that they are supported, and that they are safe. We also need to let go of failure. Every great leader, every great successful individual in life failed miserably many times. As I was growing open doors, I can tell you that there were days where I would lay on the floor and cry because it just got too hard and I messed up again because I couldn't pay payroll, I couldn't pay the bills, I couldn't figure things out, but it was the people around me, and I say this all the time, even as an adult, there were people around me that would literally say to me, yep, okay, let's try again. Swoop you up and push you along. When our kids fail, the message should not be focused on what they didn't do. Acknowledge, ask them what they want to do differently next time, and then support them in that direction. Our kids also have to know that it's okay to fail, that we want them to fail. We want them to fail so that they can then succeed. And that's a different message, by the way, than what they sometimes hear of that internalization that they're not worth something. It's a different message, and I want to be clear on that. It's, a, it's okay to fail. You just got to try harder the next round. I want you to try harder the next round. And that is so important for our kids. This is the Open Doors Academy tree. Remember I told you there was a tree before. And this is, these are the principles that we believe and, and we've researched and looked at as to what are the most critical things that kids need to succeed. We work with some of the toughest kids in the city of Cleveland. Not all. We have some really great kids is, that are very healthy families and, and balanced and, and wonderful. But we also work with some families that are struggling to survive. We work with some families that are just struggling, period. And we look at what does it take to get this kid back on the right path. And I will stress again that there are two things that I believe are the keys. One is unconditional love and verbalizing that over and over again. Our kids can't do enough to feel loved. Think of the world we live in. Our kids are growing up in a world where terrorism is on the news every day where our kids are exposed to a disruptive and dysfunctional society on a daily basis through their own social media. We were talking about this earlier. I said, I didn't know that the Gulf War was even happening when I was in high school. I remember hearing about it, but I didn't really, I was never exposed to it. And then I think about the amount of information and negative feedback our kids get on a daily basis based on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, whatever it is the amount of information they're getting, they're getting so much negative input. I mean, we all feel it, right? I mean, am I alone that people feel a little stressed lately over what's going on in our world? Okay, so imagine what that's doing for our kids who are already emotionally charged or scared and vulnerable. We need to double down. That's the work we need to be doing. We need to double down on creating and encouraging a safe, healthy, and supportive environment. We've gotta build the bubble around the kids that protects them. Because it's no longer out here. We've got to build around them and bolster them up. Um, with Parkland, Florida, you know, there's the huge argument about, you know, should we, uh, you know, new gun laws, um, put guns in schools, 
create all of those different arguments are out there, right? Now, I'm a huge proponent of new gun laws. I'm a huge proponent of we need to figure out how not to have access to guns. But I gotta be honest with you, that's not gonna solve this problem alone. I wanna go back to the idea that we live in a world that is isolated, where our kids are struggling to find who they are, where their brain is still developing. And if we don't put the supports in place for them, in home, in school, in the community, they're gonna to continue to flail. And we're gonna to continue to see these kids who just feel like it's just not worth it anymore. And they're gonna take action. That's our responsibility, to create an environment where our kids feel safe, loved, nurtured, protected. And we can't protect them from everything, but we can make them feel safe. Everybody can make their kids feel safe. We need to constantly encourage them, support them, and love them. We need to hold them accountable and teach them responsibility. This is important. They have to have accountability and responsibility. I think sometimes we feel guilty and we let that stuff go. That aids in brain development, process, information, working through things, teaching work ethic. Those are all important things. We need to always give what I call tough love. You know, it's not love that says, oh, honey, you wrecked the car, that's okay, that's okay. I still, it's okay, we'll figure it out. No, it's, you wrecked the car? Okay, there's gonna be consequences, and you're gonna pay to have it fixed, but I want you to know I'm glad you're safe and I love you, and that's all that really matters in the end. It's a different message, right? We need to be teaching accountability and responsibility, we need to be giving love. And um, my last one that I think is really important is affection. And I think I said earlier that there was a policy that I really struggled with, and that was when, and I understand why, and I'm not arguing against school policy by any stretch of the imagination, when we remove the ability for teachers and other adults to provide healthy touch to our kids, we really did more damage than good. We really did. Because our kids aren't getting it, and so they're seeking it. And when I say they're seeking it, they're seeking it in ways that we don't want them to. They're finding affection. Our young girls are seeking out attention and affection from men in ways that we don't want to because they're not understanding what healthy affection. We all need to be touched. Every human needs to be touched. It's part of who we are. It's part of what we create. It's just part of, that's part of the nature. That's the, that, is, that is who we are. We need to be touched. We all seek it and crave it. And when we deprive our kids of it, we actually do more harm than good. <coughs> And so I encourage you to hug your kids, love your kids. We do it at Open Doors. We hug every kid. We have, you know, I will at times, if I know a kid very well and, I'm, and they did something, I, I will sometimes find out they just need it, I'll just hold them and let them know they're okay and kiss them on the forehead. Our kids need to know they're safe. We live in a crazy world, and those are the most important things that you can provide to your kid that will aid in development. So I can't fix, we can't tonight, we can't fix the school system. And I don't mean, I don't mean Cleveland Heights, I mean the <laughs> national school system. But there are things that we can do to protect our kids and to protect their development that move them forward. So, that's all I have. Do you have questions? Do you want to take questions? Okay, I'll take questions. If anybody has them. Joe. Can I make a short comment? Or, you know, I wanted to share about some handouts. So um, some of you may know, I'm Joan, I'm Vice President of PTA Council, and I'm an early childhood uh, educator. But I, I have a handout in the back on how words build a baby's brain. Um, I work for the Literacy Cooperative, and I'm the um, program coordinator for the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. But we're working on something called the, um, the word gap and trying to bridge the word gap um, where, and this is what you were talking about earlier, where um, children have heard far fewer words um, in, in some households, and it's often lower income households or one where the education level isn't as, as um, great. Uh, they've heard 30 million fewer words by the age of four than um, other children. And words fill the baby's brain. And it, they have to be words from the person in that relationship. So anyway, we have a little handout, and it's, um, it's inspired by this book called 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain. Uh, by Dana Suskin. So give that to anyone you know with children under the age of five, essentially. And then I just, can I tell a story? I can't help it because 
Um, uh, pediatrician at the at Cincinnati Children's Hospital did functional MRIs on children. Um, one having hearing an audio book, and they were able to see how the brain lit up. Then hearing the audio book with real illustrations that they flipped through. Then they did it a third time with a story on a screen, the same the same one each time, but the screen telling the story. First two times. Audio book, audio with the real illustrations, the brain lit up effectively. The different parts of the brain were connecting the way you want to see it. With the screen, didn't do it. Did not connect the parts of the brain. Parts of the brain lit up, they didn't connect. What you want is those neuronal connections happening. So um, that is why the American Academy of Pediatrics makes the recommendations they do. Screens are not effective at building brains. So I just wanted to share that because I think it's really important information. It's huge, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I'll, I'll pass, pass it back. back. Oh. Can I have a question? Sure. Can you talk about just, uh, we know that lead at some low doses can you know, harm brain development and now they're learning that there's more and more, to there's toxic chemicals out there that can do that besides lead. So. Yeah, so there's, um, you know, chemicals in our environment cause damage to a number of things. Um, in a growing child, it affects their brain. It also, I mentioned kind of briefly earlier, it's, they're finding more and more connections to gut health. Um, and gut health actually affects the brain as well, and it affects the way that a child develops and, and develops autoimmune and chronic issues later on. So um, things like your cleaning supplies, um, things like mold in the house, whether it's toxic black or it's, it's just black mold. Um, uh, even some of the foods that we're eating um, have different chemicals in them that can create harm. So it's important to be educated and knowledgeable about those things and what they can do or, or what harm they can cause. So there's, um, I don't have them with me, I can always send them. There's some great sites, websites that you can go to. Um, that have information on things that you want to avoid having in your home or around your kids. Um, you know, I mean, there was the big one on Tide Pods or the Pod Packs for the laundry detergent or the even the dishwasher. Those are obviously very harmful. But exposing a lot of the things that we use that we think are just there to be good can actually cause harm in, into the development. Safer chemicals, healthy families. Uh, like so. SaferChemicals.org is a great one to check out per Jill. <laughs> no, that's great. Anything else? Yes. So you talked about um, how teenage brains really kind of use the emotions to make decisions. Are there some techniques that could be used to help teenagers? <laughs> Like, what do you do then? Absolutely. That's a great question. I forgot to mention, too, um, so, you know, they, they've moved the age of development up. So it used to be that you became an adult at 18. You are now an emerging adult from 18 to 25. So, and they're actually saying in men, it's a little bit more to 28. So, uh, <laughs> Just saying. But um, the, um, so the, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until you're 25, so you're always going to have that struggle. I think one of the techniques that you want to utilize is, is getting to your kid where in that whole cognition process, right? So they've come down, they've had some time to process, and again, it goes back to teaching your kid to think independently and to think rationally. It's not going to be the fix-all because, again, there's still that emotion still going to charge for them, but it's going to help to aid in that development. So if you're, you know, let's say they, um, um, I, a perfect example, last summer we, we built houses out in the mountains and one of the kids thought it would be a great idea to jump off the roof. And so he's launched on the roof and he's, he's yelling all his peers, of course all the kids are like, jump, jump, jump. And I'm like, so help me if you jump, I'm going to And um, let's just say he didn't jump, thankfully, but now he was so mad at me, like, I could have done it. What's your problem, blah, 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 you know? And what I learned was I walked away and I came back about 30 minutes later and I said, let's have a conversation about this. And there was a consequence, but the conversation, the consequence wasn't given in the format of you did wrong and this is your punishment. It was, let's talk about what's gonna happen because of this and how we can do it differently next time. And I think that's the conversation you wanna always have is, tell me why you think you did what you did, what you would do differently next time, and how can I help you make better decisions? Okay, so again, getting them to know that my parent supports me, um, knowing that there's a rational process to that, it's just going to help kind of 
build that, that fundamental information processing for them. But they're still going to do, like, and, and like I said, there, there are going to be moments where you're going to see them make the right decision and happens, you'll be like, <gasps> you know, it's like potty training, right? So the first time they did it, they're like, <gasps> and then all of a sudden the next day it's all, all over the place and you're like, <gasps> so you just have to remember that that's part of that stage and that time period, but you can kind of move towards developing that. As teachers, we're encouraged to use technology in our classrooms every day and to give assignments um, that integrate technology and have them turn them in on, you know, mm -hmm. to Google Classroom. So I think kids easily exceed, well exceed that screen time just doing homework and schoolwork. So um, I don't think that those standards are outside when they suggest mm -hmm. one hour or two hours that they're talking about above and beyond schoolwork. I think they're talking about period, right? They're talking about a period. Right, so I guess it makes me wonder um, what our role is as educators um, mm -hmm. to balance that, because we know every kid's gonna wanna have some social media time every day. Absolutely, it's a great question. I think, you know, they, there's some studies that say um, trying to get them to do 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, um, and that's more for the vision piece than anything else. Again, that, that damage to the eyes is really the most pertinent thing when we talk about screens. Um, I know I, you know, like we, and we've seen kids already where the cornea starts to burn out. Um, they lose, start to lose vision because of just being staring at a screen all day, um, especially if they wear contacts. Contacts are known to create a, a problem with that. Um, so I think there's ways to strategize around that and looking at, um, again, like looking at time frames for that. So how do I build in a curriculum that has some screen time but it doesn't dominate? Or how do I minimize the amount of social media time that they have with that uh, in the classroom? Um, how do I integrate technology but also keep in mind those bigger pieces and play using teamwork, um, doing things, turning, turning it off for time and then bringing it back on um, and so forth. But it is, it is a challenge because you're being asked to do one thing, the pediatricians are saying another, and there's, there's all sorts of, of information flowing back and forth. And this isn't new. Um, these are, you know, we've dealt with this with other issues in, in history. It's just this is the new challenge that we face around it. I wish I had a like, complete solution for you, but I don't. I, I think reading on, on a screen is different, though. You know, like it affects the brain. It, I don't think it quite is. My yeah. What I was talking about was for very young children, of course. So. But, well, but I think there's, so there's, there's two components to it. There's the way it affects the brain, like reading, yes. And, and most like if you're looking at, if there's a difference between looking at a, um, uh, a Kindle reader that has a, doesn't have the, the blue vibration of screen, and an iPad. So there's a difference to that. What I'm speaking to is mostly the, and I think what a lot of pediatricians talk to is the visionary issues with it. Um, so I just discovered an app, and I can't remember, I think it was like Word of Mouth, but it's called Our Fact, like our agreement. Mm -hmm. And so you basically program your child's phone so that they can have access to certain apps for longer mm -hmm. a day than they can for other times, and then it automatically turns it off between certain hours. It's like $7 a month, but that, that eliminates, like if your child is like, hey, I need 15 minutes longer to finish my homework or whatever, or check my notes, you can say, you can grant them access for 15 minutes, and then you don't have to remember to turn it off later. That like the, the program can, like turns it off by itself, oh. which is a little bit like you know because they are sneaky. It's oh, a little they're bit, sneaky. It's a little bit Big Brother, but it's also like no, this oh, is just what this is also. You can't manage your own you know everything, and then there's also so that's really helped our family and like eliminated arguments about things, and so. And that's called our pact. Our pact, yeah. Our pact. And it takes maybe like an hour to set up because you do have to plug it mm -hmm. into a computer or a Mac. But, um, and you can grant them two hours of screen time a day. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to give them more, you can. And they can kind of choose like when they use that screen time. And you know, if, you, if they really need to use their phone for whatever reason, then you can say, okay, you can shut off all the apps that say Google Docs, for example. Mm -hmm. So then my other question was, um, besides meditation and mindfulness, because that's what I am obsessed with, as far as like neuroplasticity goes, mm -hmm. what other activities can be done that um, increase neuroplasticity? So if you do have children who've had traumas or haven't had the brain development that you know is ideal, what can they? What are activities that they could do, or that you know parents can do, or an educator can do that encourages? 
Absolutely, and I've, I've got to be honest with you, that's a little out of my scope um, and understanding, so I don't want to give you a wrong answer, but my understanding of um, building brain plasticity is, is, is anything that's self-reflective, so meditation, exercise, um, anything that's going to kind of get the, the functioning going, but I'm not, I'm not an expert in that to know enough, so I, I wish I could answer, but I don't want to give you wrong info. Sorry. Okay, I learned a lot. Great. Thank you. Any other something I feel like really flies under the radar that um, I've considered a lot is the radiation of all that mm -hmm. the cell phones give off. You know, people sleep with them. My teenage daughter, she used to be in open doors. She's not a teenager anymore. Mm -hmm. She still thinks like one. It's a big joke we have. The frontal lobe is still not yet fully developed. I tell her that at least once a week. <laughs> but back to my point, the radiation. She's got her MacBook on her belly. She's got the phone next to her head. Mm -hmm. She sleeps like that at night, no matter how much. I tell her frontal lobe isn't yet developed. So, yeah. But I don't think we realize. I think it's like back in the day when you know people smoke cigarettes on an airplane and in the doctor's office. It's Absolutely. Just, I mean, it's in a little fine print, but nobody really t even takes you know that into consideration. It's Actually, they do say the worst thing that uh, you can do is, is have the phone by your head at six night. Inches. Yeah. Six inches. Yeah. And, and that's why they don't want you using it on your ear. They want you to use it away. And again, you know, it's like anything else. There's, there's very powerful lobbyists out there, that are, which is why the research isn't clear yet. I mean, really, if you look at the research, it contradicts itself always, but you don't, unfortunately, we don't know because there's very powerful lobbyists that advocate for what they want and are making money. And it's the same thing with aspartame and cigarettes and, you know, BPA, all those things that are, are, are fought for. And we find out, you know, 30 years later when it's too late, the damage that they've caused. So I think, you know, I think, again, that goes back to building healthy habits with your kids, especially when they're younger, is, you know, having rules about not putting your, your phone by the head and, and, you know, again, that finding ways to break cycles for them and, and creating those habits is really critical. Joan, you wanted to add something? Well, just, there was just a study, I heard this on the radio or read it in a paper recently, where they did a study of people who had their, their phones either on their bedside table or, you know, under their pillow versus those who had it further away. And I, I can't remember what the finding was, but there was a negative implication. Oh, yeah, bad. And there's, yeah. there's like a radioactive picture that you can see where after you've been on your cell phone for 15 minutes, your brain is lit up yeah. like a nuclear reactive site. You yeah. know, it's just yeah, like exactly. It's, but maybe yeah. they actually measured radiation. I mean, or they, they know. Have, yeah, they don't want to see it. And there was higher rates of like, yeah, like yeah. radioactivity or whatever in the, yeah. Well, one of the other things I want to mention, because you mentioned um, children who have experienced trauma very young, I think one of the things to understand is there is a very clear difference in a child who has been born or raised early on in a traumatic environment in terms of their activity of their brain and the development of their brain. So there's, there's a very distinctive difference, which is why it's so important, those early ages, to really be developing that and looking at how do I, again, creating even those recreating those that, that safe environment, the support, the love, all of those things, because those are fundamental to any development and growth we have. Um, and there's a, a wealth of research that even when we look at children in wealth versus, or affluent homes versus children in poverty, as Joan mentioned, you know, it's not just the 30 million words. There's, there's research that shows, you know, 75% of children growing up in healthy economic means um, know their alphabet upon entering kindergarten compared to 19% of children growing up in poverty. Like there are huge gaps in terms of how our kids are starting in school and how they're evolving forward. And none of these things help our kids. <laughs> like the technology doesn't help. I mean, I don't want to say technology doesn't, but the, the unlimited access to technology is a double-edged sword. So, you know, and, and that's why it is important to find those opportunities to do things. And, you know, the other thing, too, is spend time with your kids as a family. Have rules around um, screen time and, and phone usage. And, you know, maybe it's when you're out on, maybe you have a Sunday afternoon outing, and, you know, phones are left at home, except one phone that's put in the car for emergencies, right? Like, I mean, it's funny, like, none of us realize we used to all, no one used to travel with phones. And we all survived. But God help me, if I forget my phone, I'm running home. I mean, if I'm 10 minutes, if I'm 15 minutes out, I'm still coming back to my phone because I'm, you're, we're so attached to those things. Um, so creating healthy boundaries with them are really important. Anything else? 
Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you coming out. I know there was a lot going on tonight, so thank you. And if you have any questions, by the way, my info is here. You can always go to the Open Doors website, but my info is here, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Give another round of applause to Anne Marie Grassi. We love when she's speaking. <laughs> Um, I'd like to introduce Kate Gill. Um, she's one of the parents that is going to be our, at our next speaker series, which is March 6th, which is a week from tomorrow. So if you want to talk a little bit about that, it'd be great. Sure. Thanks, John. And thank you. Uh, very informative. Um, Kate. Um, I'm sort of every parent's worst nightmare in that my son died uh, of a heroin overdose a year and a half ago, and we actually are a family who, you know, I made sure he was in the right co-op preschool and spent time and did. Wasn't, you know, we're not perfect, none of us are, but really he came from a very supportive environment, but he had struggles that were biologic, which that's maybe for another conversation, but um, so um, with uh, mental illness and then with substance abuse early on which really changed his brain. So I'm speaking next week uh, with Dr. Thomas Gilson. March 6th. March 6th, Tuesday. Yeah, at the same time in this, in this auditorium um, with Dr. Gilson, who I've spoken with in the past, and he is the head of the medical examiner. We're speaking on the opioid uh, crisis epidemic. Uh, my son did die of heroin um, overdose. Um, benzodiazepines, which are also a drug that we need to be talking about. Um, and also with Dr. Uh, Omar al Hash, who is an addiction psychiatrist who I've spoken with in the past, and he's wonderful, very informative on addiction and the brain, um, you know, ideas for, you know, what parents can do, what to look for, so um, very resourceful. Um, we'll also have materials through the um, Say Collaborative through Belfair will be, um, we'll have materials on the table here, so some takeaway info. So um, I hope everyone will join us and, um, you know, learn more about really this epidemic is affecting every community um, and it is not slowing down. So uh, it's getting worse. So we need to be talking about this as, um, you know, community, parents being aware of what can we do, we need to talk with our kids, that sort of thing, to give ideas. And also, I am a big proponent of brain, of teaching kids about their own brains mm -hmm. and development. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of informing parents and community, but I would love to see more programming in schools about, so that children can learn from an early age how their brain develops and what sort of things are not good for their brains, you know, so they can embrace, um, their health and well-being would be a part of that. Mm -hmm. So there is some work going on with curriculums for that, and you know, I certainly hope that we start implementing those in Ohio. So thank you. I hope we'll see you next week. Okay, thanks, Jen. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. Again, my name is Jen Holland, I'm PTA President for Council, and uh, we hope that you come out next week for our uh, second to last um, speaker series. Our very last one is going to be. Jen will remind me, April, April 23rd, thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. On, on managing your child's screen, well, techno on media and technology. Oh, yes. On screens, oh. yeah. Karen, yeah. Karen Farley is the uh, person that's coming out for our April 23rd meeting, so please come to that as well. Um, so thank you guys for coming out. Have a good night.